Thank you very much. Nice introduction. Good morning, or good, after, good morning, everyone. It's really a big pleasure to be here for me because when I was a student in, in France, in Besançon, I wanted to come to, to, to tours for, for many times, but it didn't happen. So now it's very nice to visit tour for the first time. Um, and thank, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come here and to, uh, to give a talk. Also on behalf of my uh, boss, Dieter Schillinger, the DDG of, of INRI. So in the next uh, few 20 or 25 minutes or so, I will talk about the one health from a livestock uh, perspective and more particularly on the capacity and operationalization uh, in the global south uh, uh, for, for one health. Uh, uh, yeah, when I came here, I talked a bit about INRI, but uh, just for the information, uh, our institution is part of the uh, uh, CGIR system. It's basically 12 uh, international uh, uh, center for agriculture research for, for developing countries. And actually, the headquarter is in Montpellier in France, whereas uh, INRI is one of these 12 centers. We are based in Nairobi and Addis Ababa, but we have also some uh, different um, office in different uh, countries. Okay, I just want to, to make a few points uh, on, in, in this talk uh, on the importance of livestock sector for food security and some of the health and environmental issues linked to livestock production from One Health perspective and discuss afterwards the One Health capacity building uh, um, and operationalization uh, in, the, in, the, in developing countries. So you, you might have seen this before, but uh, uh, the discussion on the need of uh, animal source food, so namely milk, meat, and eggs in particular, is actually is very much uh, uh, rapidly uh, uh, increasing in uh, developing countries. So actually, you know, uh, the terms of developing country or now is sometimes we refer to the global south uh, um, uh, or low and middle income countries, kind of, you know, mix of, of these terms. But you can see here that actually from the high income countries, the, the, the rate uh, of, uh, of, of livestock uh, need uh, and livestock product need is actually quite stable uh, in, in the last uh, column you can see here. Whereas in different other regions in developing countries, in particular uh, Africa and Asia, uh, by 2030 you can see really rapidly growth uh, in terms of demand for beef, pork, poultry, milk, and egg as well. So this actually this needs a lot of production uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, region. And when you look, uh, cut the density uh, uh, in terms of projection uh, in future, you know, most of this increase happening in uh, the global south, you know, Africa, Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, uh, to meet the demand of this, uh, uh, actually, uh, um, uh, uh, people in this country. And when you look at the statistics, it's not very updated, but the trend is still there. It's in fact, you know, most of the a livestock production is in the hand of the small holder uh, uh, for developing countries. In the north, you know, it's about 10 to 20 percent. So, you know, of course, industrial livestock, uh, uh, you know, uh, developed this very, very nicely. But in developing countries, for example, where I come from, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and Africa, for example, about 70 percent of meat, milk, and egg are produced by the small holder. When we refer to small holder, it means that, you know, they have quite uh, a small scale uh, uh, in, 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 the, in their production uh, system. So this is uh, data from different organizations showing. And that is on livestock side. And recently with the pandemics, we talk more and more about the bush meat and wild meat consumption in different countries. And from that perspective, from a livestock research uh, perspective, we, also, uh, we are also dealing with that. For example, here you look at the data in 2016 on, uh, for, for China. Uh, of course, it's after the pandemic, China banned all this uh, um, uh, wildlife farming and um, uh, animal, uh, wild animal trade. Uh, we are not sure what's happening in the, in the reality uh, between the policy and, and the reinforcement. But for example, the, the, the wildlife uh, uh, farming industry in China is really huge. It's a business of 73 uh, billion US dollar and it's employed also uh, uh, many people uh, in, in this country. And this, of course, is a big business. When you move to another country in Southeast Asia, for example, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, you also proportionally see this kind of thing. And the consumption of wild meat animals in Southeast Asia and China is kind of, you know, kind of, you know the high value uh, uh, food compared to the 
uh, food insecurity uh, in Africa. During COVID, for example, many people poach and hunt wild animals for food because they don't have uh, food for that. So it's, it's come from different perspectives. Too. But the point I want to make is, in fact, from a livestock point of view, we have the uh, livestock in the classic mean, but, um, but also you know, the wildlife uh, farming in different countries and consumption. And of course, you, you, you hear also different types of challenges linked to livestock from health and environment, for example. In one way, it provides nutrition, health, and food security for people, but some of the health issues in particular uh, relevant to One Health concept, for example, food safety, uh, infectious disease, and AMR, for example. Uh, it is uh, linked uh, on the bad side of things of livestock. And you know, uh, our previous uh, speaker talking about One Health in terms of non-communicable non disease and, and obesity. And also the environment perspective, we talk a lot about climate change because some of the emission issue. And it mixes a little bit, the, it, it affects a bit the development of livestock between the north and the south. And to, to remind you that you know, many people in the south don't have access to animal source food or protein. So actually, the discussion is a bit, we have a lot of nuance between the north where people eat too much meat, in particular beef, uh, you know, linking to climate change, whereas in the south, people should have the right to eat meat, uh, and, and it's sometimes affected by this global discussion of, uh, of, of climate change. Uh, here, I, I just want to address some of the lessons learned of the work we are working, we are doing, we have been doing in CGI in INRI, but also uh, in embracing also uh, the work of other people on the topic of livestock and the informal market. So it's very much linked to the food safety. You know, uh, you know we really address three things, food safety, AMR, and, and zoonosis. And you know that you know, most of the food in developing countries coming from the informal market, or sometimes we call it traditional market. And when we move to the east in China and Southeast Asia, we also call it the, the, the wet market, depending on where, where we talked about. And it's, uh, it's, it's estimated about 80 to 90 percent of food for people in that area coming from informal market. And we have challenge, uh, challenges in this uh, type of setting because the hygiene is not good. Sometimes the infrastructure is not optimal. So the safety of food sometimes is not uh, um, uh, good over there. And we need to address uh, this thing. And uh, recently, the report from uh, WHO and the World Bank showing that the burden of foodborne diseases is comparable to the big tree in terms of DALI's loss, uh, you know, namely HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and, and malaria. So that's why you know, the attraction to fund some of this research on food safety is also important recently. And in terms of economics, a loss is about 100 billion US dollar loss per year due to the foodborne diseases. And in this uh, context, what do we do? Uh, actually, we, we come up with the risk-based approach and also uh, uh, some intervention uh, that is simple and social accept, uh, socially acceptable in this kind of environment. So we conduct risk assessment to estimate the burden of health and economics of these uh, foodborne diseases, but really coming up with very uh, practical and, and simple uh, uh, technology and training to change the behavior of different uh, food actors along the value chain, in particular linked to livestock, people working in a slaughterhouse, and in the wet market, and where they, um, they, they, are, they have the critical, uh, critical control point to control the, the safety of this thing, and for that we work on the kind of simple technology to address uh, this thing. And sometimes you see the, the standard in this some of the country are not met uh, uh, by, 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 by the food system over there. It, traditionally, if you take a pork or meat sample in the wet market, you find the salmonella uh, contamination prevalence is about 50%, whereas where you go here in France or developed countries is so 1% to 2%. So, but the standard of the country is they want really to bring down this uh, prevalence uh, uh, to, to zero, and I think that is not realistic at all. So we need this kind of an acceptable risk between these two, and, and with that we, we work on a different technology, but also from a social uh, perspective, for example, here uh, introducing the nudge uh, to stimulate the chain of behavior both from the slaughterhouse and also the market level. Uh, the second area we have worked on is about antimicrobial resistance. And of course, you know, uh, it's very uh, uh, interesting and promising to see the perspective in Europe, European country. You know, you could bring down very much the use of antibiotics in livestock and human health sectors. Here are data showing that actually uh, uh, you are in, on the right track to fight the antibiotics resistance. In, uh, in, in Europe, whereas in developing countries, 
the overuse of antibiotics in livestock and aquaculture production, for example, is uh, very uh, uh, prevalent, in particular in Southeast Asia. Uh, but you have also the issue in Africa, some area, they don't have access to antibiotics for, for this livestock. So it's kind of a mix of thing. But the bottom line here is, in fact, you know, uh, you have quite high prevalence of infectious disease. Uh, um, and also the access to uh, 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 drug, uh, vet drugs is varies from one country to another. And in particular, the knowledge of farmers on AMR is not there in most of the case, but also the incentive for them to use antibiotics to push the crop promotion of animals is one of the key uh, uh, issues that we need to, 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 um, to work on. We have also uh, the issue of uh, you know, low quality of antibiotics uh, and also uh, you know, how people trust the local vet in uh, prescribing or, or seeking the, the support from local vet or not when the, the animals are sick. So it's very really from one region to, an, uh, to another. And, and in these kind of areas, you, know, you, you, don't, you have very low of, you know, kind of, you know, biosecurity and, and the environment. And, and dealing with AMR in, in that area is very, very challenging. Uh, the next area is about uh, uh, zoonotic disease or neglected tropical diseases. And, and the challenge here also that, you know, um, uh, basically is for some of these uh, tropical neglected diseases when the country uh, increase the level of economic growth, so automatically the infrastructure is also improved. For in Vietnam, for example, 20 years back, we, have a, we had a very high prevalence of cystic psychosis, and now our, our studies show very low, uh, less than 1% prevalence in quite remote area. And it's linked very much on the improvement of sanitation system, thanks to the investment of government and also behavior change. But this has been very challenging for many African countries and remote area. Uh, we have solution in some of these things, and I like the, 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 the approach Chris uh, uh, talked about environment before, and actually very much up from on my uh, previous work, we refer to eco-health approach. So, so to solving certain uh, complex health issue, we, uh, we really need the like one health is part of the system approach we are, we are working, but we need really a kind of integrated intervention, you know, not about you know, vaccines, not about drug uh, uh, alone, but also in the same time investing on sanitation and water and also behavior change. And only, only in this way, we can solve comprehensively uh, the, the, the things related to neglected tropical diseases. Another area linked to livestock is about emerging infectious diseases. And here, uh, this is zoonotic disease, in particular, Rift Valley fever. Uh, uh, in Kenya, in particular, uh, our colleagues are working on is really to look at different risk factors and also coming up uh, with a vaccination strategy for, 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 for the country. And recently, you know, European are also concerned about Rift Valley fever. I think that EU developed a new program uh, uh, to fund Rift Valley fever work because uh, there's a lot of transmission or you know, increasing transmission uh, of Rift Valley fever into EU uh, because of the travelers uh, from Africa and, 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 and other countries. And actually, from our uh, perspective of livestock, we look at uh, both from the wildlife and also from livestock uh, to come up with a solution. Uh, for example, here there are some trials of vaccines. It's not my area. But actually, in Kenya, we have a, a range. We have a, 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 a park. Uh, of 13,000 hectares where uh, that can offer very good interface between animal, wildlife, uh, livestock, human, and environment to test different type of vaccines and also studying on the interaction of, of different groups um, of human and, and animals in, in that areas. And uh, finally, here, uh, in the context of, of COVID-19 pandemics, um, we did some research to look at the impact of, of COVID-19 on food system, in particular, in, on uh, in, in developing countries, for example, the capacity of uh, purchase of food uh, and, and uh, reduction of income. But also from a One Health perspective, it's uh, quite interesting to see on, so in uh, developing countries that you know, people are using animal health uh, facility system to do more testing of COVID because public health system cannot really meet the demand of some of these countries. So we have project uh, in Kenya funded by BMZ Germany, for example, where we help Kenyan government to analyze uh, something around 30,000 uh, COVID uh, samples during uh, the pandemic. And it's shown so nicely how animal health and public health uh, people can work together to address some of these uh, uh, pandemic uh, issues. 
Now, let, let me move to a, a little bit on, on, on the perspective of future and how to address uh, the One Health from a livestock uh, perspective. Here, I would say that, you know, we are in one uh, very glad to see the open definition of One Health uh, recently developed by OLEP, uh, One Health High Level uh, Experts Panel in 2021, and this is very much uh, up, uh, approved and supported by, by uh, um, WHO, FAO, uh, OIE, WA, and, and also UNEP, um, joy to support this definition. And it links a little bit to my question to, um, to, 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 uh, to Chris uh, in the uh, uh, previous talk, is about what is the One Health here? And, and finally, you see One Health can be everything when you look at this uh, new definition. It can be climate change, it can be uh, obesity, it can be uh, environmental health. And of course, each of us here, uh, it looks to me that this is the first uh, uh, One Health conference or meeting I saw uh, many people from medical sites uh, to come. Because usually when I, we go to One Health conference, for example, it's very much dominated by, by vet people. So, so can you raise your hand if you are uh, from animal health or veterinarians? Okay, you know, not many. Uh, can you raise your hand if you are more from medical science uh, side of things? You see, this is really 50-50, very good, uh, um, very good uh, uh, proportion here. But, you know, we, we can position ourselves also in the, from a perspective of the interest of the institution and, and about, the, uh, about the work we are doing. So, so from that point of view, uh, INRI as a, a livestock research institute, we develop the One Health strategy where we position what is One Health for us and what type of One Health work we, we can do. And, of course, we can come up with a quite a large first, uh, uh, vision, but the key uh, teams areas uh, we can address from, uh, from INRI and CGI is really on epidemics and pandemics uh, caused by emerging uh, viruses. Uh, we work on endemic zoonosis uh, because it's very much with the poor people. Uh, the foodborne diseases I uh, mentioned before and antimicrobial resistance, AMR. And the way we do is really coming up with three main pillars on technical, it's more on the research side of things, but more and more we look at the policy and the institutional setup of One Health. Because at the end of the day, you know, with a lot of research, night research, uh, we show how to bring it to make One Health happen uh, on the ground to change uh, um, the life of, of people. And uh, we are having a few uh, uh, initiatives at the moment uh, to address this One Health in the new context. Uh, actually, we, uh, we have at the moment uh, one CGI initiative on One Health, so I, I have a pleasure to lead and co-lead this with our colleague from, from IPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, to protect human health by improving the detection, uh, prevention, and control of zoonosis, foodborne diseases, and AMR in developing countries. So this is actually a global uh, uh, project. Uh, we work in seven countries, so three in Asia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, and in uh, Africa, we work uh, in Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya, and, and um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. You see, uh, the three main pillars is really to reduce the disease emissions and transmission of uh, zoonotic diseases, uh, foodborne diseases, and AMR. Uh, Sky up, you know, main pillar, one hell we, we refer to, as you can see uh, here. But also, we add a, a quite uh, interesting component to look at the economics, uh, governance, and behavior uh, of One Health. Uh, as I said before, um, we need to identify the barriers uh, of, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that prevent uh, uh, from applying this uh, One Health at the institutional and, and government level, and also the environmental, looking at, at water issue. Another set of projects, is, and, and this is very much focusing on Africa. We have a set of projects uh, funded by Germany and, and, and OECPS from EU, uh, looking at the research on One Health for Africa, but in the same time, strengthening the capacity of the government and One Health practitioners in, in, in Africa. Here we have a One Health Center in Africa looking at the capacity building uh, in different countries uh, on neglected zoonotic diseases, emerging infectious diseases, food safety, informal market, and AMR. And recently, the COHESA project standing for capacitating One Health in Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, looking at the uh, more on the operational aspect of One Health in 11 countries in Africa. And to do that, I think that now strengthening the national One Health platform or partnership is important. 
Uh, we have some good examples. For example, Vietnam, they developed the One Health Partnership where they bring Ministry of Health, Agriculture, and Environment to work together on One Health at the ministry government level. In Kenya, they have the Zoonotic Disease Unit where health and agriculture ministries work together to control zoonotic disease. But actually, this is very high level. And I think that you know, most of international organizations and research institutes need to assist them to strengthen the intersectoral collaboration at national level. That is uh, important. But also, it's not about the high level strengthening capacity of One Health alone. We need to bring One Health also on the ground. And for that, we develop different One Health fin sites or labs at the local level. Because you need to really bring local people from different perspectives, for example, public health people, animal health, uh, university, but even uh, students, like many people, are doing the master of One Health here to work together on a specific site to make One Health happen. We opened the One Health site in Taiwan uh, last week, but we develop also other One Health sites in southern and western of Kenya, where we uh, have access to the lab in the field so that people can sample and treat uh, and analyze some of the basic uh, uh, analysis in, 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 in the crowd. And for the more advanced analysis, you can send up the words to the more advanced lab in, in different provinces. The next thing is about uh, next generation of One Health uh, uh, people of next generation. And actually, Chris already uh, addressed this very nicely. I just want to bring the, uh, the example from Southeast Asia and Africa here. Uh, USAID has been funding quite a bit a uh, program on capacity building for universities. So we have Southeast Asia One Health University Network in re contributed to that also. And we develop curriculum, uh, we, do, we develop training for students, but also for lecturers at university and government people about the core competency of One Health. A core competency is not about zoonotic disease, AMR, food safety, but also the soft skins on behavior change working together because intersectoral collaboration is important. In Africa, we work also with University Council for East Africa to develop curriculum on One Health, on food safety, that uh, being applied also in different universities in, in that region. Uh, and finally, I think that the coordination of One Health is important. In Africa, you have many One Health projects. For example, our study showing, you can see here, 100 and 100 One Health projects in Africa. But it looks like that the coordination is not very optimal there, so that we cannot, at the moment, uh, achieve very high impact. So coordination is also key for, for One Health. Or in Southeast Asia, you have also many people, organizations working on One Health, and I hope that we can coordinate better in, in, in different regions to, to work on that. Final slides, I think. From these uh, things, you know, as uh, we are from research perspective, so we need to come up with more evidence on One Health, and this is one of the reports we developed together with uh, UNEP during the pandemics on ne preventing the next pandemics, addressing the cause of uh, uh, pandemics, but also the solution for that. But recently, we launched a kind of, you know, a different reports uh, to promote the investment in One Health. Because the developing countries, you know, that is really the place to apply and One Health problem come. But the investment is very limited and minimal and sometimes almost zero from their own country. To do One Health in this country, most of the resource coming from outside. You can see uh, in different examples. So I think that we need to advocate more on investment to make the case of One Health. And here we launched a series of uh, brief to invest, uh, how to show donors, to show uh, uh, government and also practitioner on or private sector how to invest in One Health linked to livestock in particular to ensure different type of things, for example, through uh, food safety, through AMR, through zoonotic disease, through environment, but even on, on gender. And, and we need to translate this into the policy. So we had some example. We work, we developed nicely One Health work on food safety. We brought into the government, government take up to develop new program to control food safety in Vietnam, uh, for example. And to do that, it's not about a medic or, or vet uh, or politician, but really the example to re really need to bring all these people together around the table. So that is about One Health working together. The example, we work on parasitic diseases in Laos where we could bring government people, medical people, vet, but also uh, scientific and school to discuss and with some uh, continue, uh, uh, you know, intervention, that is the Akama Cross project funded by EU, implemented by CIRAT uh, um, in particular in, in Southeast Asia. Okay, it brings me to the end uh, with some key message. I think that, you know, um, livestock is important in ensuring the food security in our world, in particular for developing countries. Um, uh, but this represents some health issues and challenges we need to, to, to address uh, for livestock, but also for uh, wildlife farming. 
and as the capacity building and operationalization of One Health in developing country need to be done really from different levels, regional, country, but also local level, like I talked about the One Health FinSci and One Health Lab. And from a research perspective, I think that we discussed this morning already, we need to come up with the portfolio to address different perspectives on research capacity building, but also engage also stakeholders from different sectors to address One Health. And hopefully we can uh, prepare better, detect, and, and respond uh, to this health challenge. Thank you very much for the attention. Testing? Okay. Uh, so do we have any questions from the audience? Just down here. Thank you so much for the talk there. That was really interesting. I really uh, enjoyed the fact that you were talking about behavioral science and nudging and also um, the need for more investment and educating people that this is an, a really important cause that needs to be addressed more. Um, one question that I had particularly was about um, your point on um, lower middle income countries um, when you said that um, f uh, wild markets are in fact safer, most you were saying, than supermarkets. Um, and I was, I, yeah, I'd like you to expand on that because wouldn't there be more regulation in supermarkets? Like in, in supermarkets? Okay. <laughs> so if you if I get the question well, it's uh, actually you want to know more about the role of wet market or traditional market. Yeah. Related Why to it would be safer? Because you. Were yeah. Ah, so, so how are it safer? Yeah. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the traditional market is not safer than than than, than the supermarket. But it's not always less safe than uh, in, in uh, than supermarket in different contexts. Some of the studies shown um, uh, show that in Africa and Southeast Asia, uh, you know, some of the samples, meat samples from supermarket, have the same level of contamination of bacteria, or sometimes higher than the traditional market uh, or, 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 or wet market. Uh, and you know, this can be explained by the electric system, there are many power cut in these type of places, and you have a very you know, fast turnover of uh, uh, meat in, in, uh, in traditional market. You know, they slaughter and two or three hours after you know, everything is sown. So, so, so that is actually the, 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 the balance between the two. However, uh, from a long-term perspective, we, we need to improve more uh, the hygiene and the practice in, in, in traditional market. Uh, because we cannot close this. Uh, you see the example of China to close some of the wet market because of the pandemic. But, uh, but this is actually the place where people buy food and you know, regenerating also livelihood for, for many poor people. So the, the point is not to close, but how to manage better to in the same time you know, having ac uh, giving access to people and also make sure that the social uh, uh, benefit uh, of, of this type of group of people involved in, in the wet market. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, do we have any questions from the online audience? Seems not. Uh, any further questions from the audience, quickly? Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I just had a question about um, agricultural intens intensification that you briefly mentioned. Is there sometimes a tension between... Um, increased intensification with all the problems relating to infectious diseases and um, animal welfare versus, I suppose, more free-range livestock farming that might solve some of those issues but in risks encroaching on natural ecosystems with risk of spillover events and so on. And how do you navigate that? Yeah. You see, the, the, the livestock intensification in particular or, or aquaculture, um, actually, it's linked very much to some of this One Health uh, issue. And, you know, our agriculture intensification is, uh, in general, is happening everywhere. And we, I think that we cannot avoid it. And even the, the graph I show on animal uh, source food demand growing in, in different countries. Um, so, so, so how, how, how to control it uh, or how to manage it better in future is, is a big question. And I think that you know, uh, studies currently show that you know, in, in terms of 
antibiotic use in livestock and aquaculture. Uh, farmers tend to use much more than needed. And I think that we have an opportunity uh, uh, to reduce antibiotic use in that areas. A few years back, uh, the data estimates show that you know, to produce one kilogram of uh, pig uh, or, or pork or chicken live weight, uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries use from 150 to 200 milligrams of antibiotics. Whereas in the Danish, Danish system, they use something like 10 to 20 milligrams. So it's a, it's a factor of 10 uh, higher in Southeast Asia compared to European system. So I think that you know, we have an, an opportunity, uh, opportunity to reduce from that thing, and it should come from biosecurity, it should come from behavior change, and knowledge of, of farmers. And also in particular, we need also a, a stronger uh, 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 reinforcement system of regulation in the country uh, to control uh, some of these things.